Okay, hello, good morning everyone. Um, welcome to From Windrush to Yarl's Wood, the immigration debate today. This is the first debate in the strand um, Identity Wars, Race and Society, which is in partnership with All in Britain. I'm Fraser Myers, I'm a staff writer at Spiked and I host the Spiked podcast. Um, I don't want to spend too much time introducing the topic, um, other than to say that clearly the Windrush scandal earlier in the year to me, seem to demonstrate that public opinion on immigration is a lot more nuanced than it's often presented. Um, I want us to explore some of that, those nuances today, and obviously Brexit means that Britain will need to come up with its own immigration policy, um, so it'd be useful to know what we actually want from that. Um, so to discuss this, we've got a stunning panel who I'll quickly introduce. Speaking first will be Patrick Vernon, an established social commentator, founder of 100 Black Britons, editor of Black History magazine. Uh, Patrick was a leading campaigner in the fight for justice for the Windrush children and has also successfully campaigned for the government to, to recognize a Windrush day. Then we'll have uh, Zabina beplash Bal, chair of the liberal think tank uh, Freiburg Institute and the Germany correspondent for Spiked. Then after her, Philippe Legrain, founder of the Open Political Economy Network author of Aftershock, Reshaping the World Economy After the Crisis, and very pertinent for this session, Immigrants, Your Country Needs Them. He was also a former special advisor to the World Trade Organization, so maybe he'll come in handy after March 2019 on that front. Um, and finally, uh, Manira Mirza, who's the former London Deputy Mayor and co-founder of All in Britain, who are partners for this session and strand. So I'm going to let them speak for around five to seven minutes, no more, and then we're gonna come straight back out to you so we can have a great conversation. So, um, Patrick, would you like to kick us off with yeah, your sure. thoughts? All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my parents, um, they're part of the Windrush generation. They came to uh, Wolverhampton um, in the late 50s. And like other people from different parts of the Caribbean, um, as well as Africa, they were, uh, they were part of the Windrush generation, that time period post Second World War, up to up to the 70s they were invited as British subjects to help rebuild the country as part of the reconstruction of the Second World War and because the Caribbean and other parts of the former um, parts of the British Empire when Britain said when mother called people came and that was part of that that DNA and that connection because of history so 70 years on from the arrival of the M HMT Empire Windrush I think in many ways that has symbolized a generation, a generation of Caribbean migrants, but also recognizing the wider post-war migration from different parts of the British Empire to the UK. The place I grew up in Wolverhampton is like many cities up and down the countries uh, have benefited, benefited from migration. And in, in many ways, many aspects of British society today would be unrecognizable without the contribution of immigration and integration in terms of the NHS, monarchy even, Language, literature, enterprise, public life, fashion, music, politics, science, culture, food, and even humour. So then, who would have imagined in 2018 with the whole issue of the women's generation becoming a major news story or foreseen the political fallout as British citizens of Caribbean heritage, many of whom have spent most of their lives in the UK, losing their rights, losing their homes, their livelihoods, and even in this situation, there have been two deaths in the UK and three in the Caribbean as a result of the hostile environment. A policy which saw British citizens, I have to emphasise it, there were British citizens treated as illegal immigrants facing deportation or being refused entry. And you probably saw the news story of the gentleman who had, after 25 years, had come back to the UK. I see the Windrush scandal as another episode of Britain's history of racism and treatment of the black community. I can notice it if you notice my T-shirts. Uh, so back in the day, and um, this was my, my experience of uh, my parents' experience: no blacks, nor dogs, nor Irish. And we'll flip this round: more blacks, more dogs, more Irish. You can <laughs> see here. Um, so in the colour bar, black people were banned from buying or renting homes. They were they were given less pay compared to the white workers. Discrimination in the workplace and harassment by the police. At the heart of the Second World War. Lyra Constein, who became a lord, had a job working for the government to help to um, resettle uh, and help people who were um, from the Caribbean during, for the, as part of the RAF to help them sort out digs and accommodation. 
he booked um, a room in the Pira Hotel, uh, which is still that exists in central London, in Bloomsbury. Well, and then when he turned up to book in, he was refused entry in the grounds of the colour bar. Um, and he took the hotel to the High Court and won. And that's probably one of those first cases of race discrimination. You have Paul Stevenson, uh, who organised a Bristol boycott in the 60s, and you had Asriff Xavier, who took British Rail to court because of a colour bar at Houston Station, also in the 60s. So in many ways, what's happened is there have been a series of legislations of government bodies trying to tackle the issues of structural racism, and that's been a result of the Winners' Generation doing these campaigns over these many years as well. We can't forget the issues around stop and search in the 70s and 80s and the sus laws, the rights that we had in the 80s, and the death of Stephen Lawrence in 1993. This is part of this history of the women's um, generation. And then with, when, with the scandal itself, what happened? Landing cards were destroyed. And we're still trying to find out where, where those landing cards are, because that is also part of black British history as well. And the funny thing about the whole Windrush scandal, during the whole of April and May, when it was kind of well publicised in the media, it was the first time ever that the public understood the Windrush, the ship itself, the Windrush generation, that, 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 the different generations of migrants coming here as British citizens, and the contribution that they have made as part of the 70th anniversary this year. And in many ways, it's a big indictment on this country that because the Windrush is not part of the national curriculum, the Windrush contribution is not part of the DNA and part of the national narrative of Britishness as well. Uh, and that's what I think that's maybe in many ways resonated with a lot of people up and down the country that realise we've missed a trick here. We've not, we've not been informed, we've not been educated as well. So one of the key things is that people talk a lot about the hostile environment that started back um, as a result of the Immigration Act of 2014. But you, have to, you need to go further back. I grew up in Wolverhampton. Uh, when my parents moved to Wolverhampton, the local MP was Enoch Powell. I was a six-year-old at the time when he was there, when he opened my junior school. And this year, we had the reunion, uh, Central TV. They invited myself and other former pupils and teachers. And we went, I went back to school for the first time. And uh, what's interesting, because at that time, when the school was built in the 60s, um, we were classed as immigrant children. Despite the fact that I was born in Wolverhampton, all my peers from, uh, from uh, who were of Punjabi background, East African background, a whole range of different experiences. Most of us were born in Wolverhampton, but we were classed as immigrant children. When Enoch Powell made his speech, Rivers of Blood, uh, one of the key uh, two aspects of the speech which people don't realise, that generated a lot of hate crime and attacks, racial attacks against the black and Asian community in Wolverhampton, particularly. Um, and secondly, uh, his, he talked a lot about dependent children being sent back home. 50 years later, you have Paulette Wilson, also from Wolverhampton. She came to Wolverhampton as a 10-year-old, and, and she spent two spells in Yarlswood um, as, as a result of being treated as a legal immigrant, even though she was British. And actually, Enoch Powell's speech talks about Paulette as a dependent that should be deported back. Um, and to me, that's where, we, if we're going to talk about the hostile environment, we need to go back to his speech and how his speech has influenced all political parties over the last 50 years in shaping immigration policy, that Labour, Conservative, coalition government, everyone has been influenced by that. And the tipping point was that immigration up to 2014, which we now know um, has led to the situation that we're facing. So to conclude, in many ways, um, the campaign's not over for Windrush. The government, uh, even though they are promised to look at issues around compensation, we need to make sure that the compensation scheme is fair, equitable, and the government does not put any cap on compensation payments. Each case should be looked at. How do you look at the fact, how do you assess the death of Sarah O'Connor? She died a few weeks ago of hypertension as a result of trying to fight for status. Or Dexter Gordon, who had a cardiac arrest in Camden High Street, also fighting for status. Or someone like the gentleman who's been, who was taken 25 years to come back to the UK. Each case needs to be assessed separately. And finally, in terms of the issue of citizenship and Britishness, um, one of the key issues that we're concerned about is that the government now are saying that if you have a criminal record or of poor character, whatever that means, um, you, you'll be denied citizenship, even though those children of the Windrush generation were British in the first place. I'll stop there.
It's Sabina. Yeah, yesterday I went to a session here uh, on populism, and one of the speakers said that we were moving more towards a, a native, nativism, um, so a homogeneous society based on the idea of people belonging according to where they were born. Now, I think actually Windrush shows that he was probably wrong in relation to Britain, because I think, you know, as we just heard, the majority of the public understood that um, the people had every right to stay in this country. People who had lived here for so long, who had contributed to the society, who had built a relationship to the society, who had paid taxes. I think he was probably also wrong. I can't say too much about Britain because I come from Germany, but I think he was probably also wrong in relation to Germany now, um, because we've been having um, surveys consistently showing that most Germans, a majority, a, a quite a big majority think that people who've come to the country as immigrants or as refugees, which is a different matter, but um, people who've come to the country, even as asylum seekers, whose um, re request for asylum has been turned down, should have the permission to stay um, and should have a permanent residence permit if they have integrated, if they have found work, or if they are involved in a meaningful training for job. So the latest such survey was done in August 2018, published by Die Welt newspaper. 58% of the German population said people should be allowed to stay. Now, that's a different matter to Windrush, quite different, but it does show that this idea of nativism, the idea of people belonging to a country based on ethnicity or on where they were born, um, has completely changed. We've come quite a long way in Germany from the 1980s, um, when we still had a, you know, a, an immigration policy based very much on this kind of ethnic idea, when you know the Kohl government um, uh, st stopped immigration from Turkey, making it very hard for Turkish immigrants to bring in family members. At the same time, opening up immigration um, from for Germans from Eastern Europe, it was part of a Cold War thing. It was it was a very sort of Germanic thing, and I think we've we've moved away from that. We have a much more enlightened idea of citizenship and who belongs to the country. Does that mean that the government should be tough on immigration in general, which is also one of the questions posed in the um, introduction to this session? I don't think there is very much indication for this. Now, that might sound um, you know, contradictory. So it seems like our governments are in a real bind when it comes to immigration. It seems that from their point of view, whatever they do seems to be wrong. So Angela Merkel opened the borders in 2015, she was cheered, and now it's seen as her greatest mistake. At the same time, her opponents, conservative opponents, who thought they could really benefit from that, make profit from that, who've, you know, who've gone around the country on a policy of tough immigration control, a cap on immigration, namely the former um, head of the Bavarian, uh, the minister of the Bavarian state, Seehofer, who's now interior minister, are even more unpopular than Merkel. So his popularity ratings are, are, are you know, are, are quite low. 52% of the Germans think he's doing a very, very bad job. So what's going on? What should the government do? Um, do we have a fickle uh, public which doesn't know what it really wants? I think there probably isn't a clear line on immigration. I do think the public is probably quite divided. Uh, we don't have the sort of general consensus in, in, in Rousseau's sense when it comes to immigration. But I, I think if that's the case, then first of all, because we've had a very narrow, quite technocratic debate on immigration. So um, people who have been critical have quickly been criticized for being racist. We've always focused very much on numbers um, rather than going to the, to the core of the debate of what kind of society do we want to really live in, what, what happens when people come into the country. So that's the first problem. But I think the second problem which has emerged is that what we see is that people don't want to be tough on immigration, but they do want more control over immigration. I think that is, that is a consensus. So the problem Merkel had when she opened the borders was not so much, I don't think her mistake was that she opened the borders. Actually, I personally think she did the right thing. But it was that she appeared very, very aloof. It became increasingly more about her, herself. You know, when she said people who criticized her, she said, um, if we can't show a friendly face to people who are coming here, this is not my country anymore, which people took rightly very, very badly from a chancellor of, 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 the, uh, you know, of the country. Um, she couldn't fill her relatively sensible statement that Germany can manage with any content. She left most of the everyday problems, the challenges to the local communities. So um, 
what was actually a humanitarian act to start off with became increasingly a very authoritarian act. And I think that's what people don't want. They don't want a government deciding completely on its own, aloof, without being, you know, without being in touch, uh, without being able to explain what, what, why they are doing what they are doing. And so Merkel came across as equally authoritarian as her opponent, Seehofer, who's, you know, who wants a cap on immigration, which is also authoritarian. Why would he say 200,000? Can he explain why not 100,000? Why not 500,000? Why not a million immigrants? I think what we can learn from all this is we need to open up the debate on immigration. Um, we need, uh, people, people do want more control. Um, and I think that's quite a promising uh, thing to, you know, to start off on. Thank you, Tavina. Late. Uh, the Windrush scandal uh, reminds us of the inhumane lengths uh, to which government officials uh, will go uh, when following political orders amid a climate of hysteria uh, and hostility. Our fellow human beings, our fellow citizens, become the other, the objects of fear uh, and anger, scarcely human at all. And the fact that people who've made a life for themselves in Britain, who've contributed uh, so much, were then, treated, were then treated so badly by home, home office officials, threatened uh, with deportation to a country they scarcely knew because they couldn't prove uh, their immigration status, is also a chilling warning uh, for EU citizens uh, who are forever being reassured by the, the government that everything will be okay. They need cast iron guarantees that something won't happen like this, won't happen to them uh, in future when, once we've all forgotten about it. The good news, though, is that the Wind Windrush scandal has prompted an unprecedented uh, outpouring of support uh, across Britain, uh, across uh, the uh, political class, uh, for the victims uh, of Home Office uh, abuse. And I think that has a broader significance for uh, the immigration debate in this country. Because for more than a decade, the focus of that debate has been unrelentingly negative. There's been little pushback against ever harsher and ever more harmful government policy, like the ban uh, on living on your foreign partner if you're not rich enough. If you as a British citizen uh, don't earn more than 18,600, Pounds, you can't get a visa for your foreign spouse to come live with you here. And that rises, shockingly, if you have a child, 22,400. The architect of the vile, uh, hostile uh, environment policy uh, traded that perceived success uh, for the keys uh, of Downing Street. The Brexit referendum uh, unleashed uh, and legitimized unprecedented levels of racism uh, and uh, xenophobia into the mainstream political debate whether it was the breaking point poster uh, that Nigel Farage uh, stood in front of, uh, or Boris Johnson warming about Britain being swamped by millions or tens of millions of Turkish uh, immigrants, uh, a country, of course, from which his great-grandfather uh, came. But now, uh, as a result uh, of the Rindra scandal, for the first time in more than a decade, anti-immigrant campaigners are on the back foot. And for those of us who believe in a different kind of society, in an, in an open society uh, that welcomes newcomers, or indeed those who believe uh, that freedom of movement is a fundamentally important uh, human right, that is an opportunity that needs to be seized. And the big picture is that it's not just uh, the Windrush scandal. Uh, public attitudes to immigration have become much more positive in recent years. And I think three big things have changed. The first is that the, the political saliency of migration has plunged uh, since uh, the Brexit referendum. It's no longer listed among voters' top three concerns, uh, perhaps because they have uh, bigger things to worry about. Second, net migration uh, has plunged. And as increasing numbers of Polish and East European migrants uh, go home, people in Britain are perhaps becoming uh, more aware uh, of all the valu valuable contribution uh, that they make whether that is uh, caring uh, for patients in the NHS or indeed uh, for uh, the elderly, whether it's ensuring uh, that supermarkets are stocked 
uh, full of British fruit and veg that they pick, pack, uh, and process, or indeed in starting one in four uh, of the startups uh, in London's tech city. And third, and perhaps most positively, is that you know, British people now have a much more positive uh, view of the impact of immigration, both economic and cultural. Um, the majorities have swung from most people thinking as a negative impact to most people thinking as a positive impact uh, over the past few years. Now, that is the opportunity. Regrettably, uh, that change in attitudes is not being reflected uh, in government policy. And you might hope that Sajid Javid, as the um, son of a bus driver who was born uh, in Pakistan, who's now the first uh, non-white uh, Britain of immigrant background to hold on the great offices of state might have taken a, a more uh, liberal approach. After all, he's a stellar example himself uh, of the huge potential uh, of immigration. Uh, at the same time, he wants to be prime minister, uh, and you don't win many votes among uh, Tory members by going soft on immigration. So he smoothed some of the rough edges of Theresa May's policies on Windrush, of course, on uh, less emphasis on the net migration target, which leads to absurd decisions to meet an arbitrary uh, figure, uh, or indeed by lifting uh, the monthly quotas which deprive uh, the NHS of the ability to hire foreign doctors uh, and nurses. But if you look at his new proposals for post-Brexit policy, uh, they're very disappointing. Now they sign neutral, they sound technocratic. Who, who could be opposed to a skills-based uh, migration policy? But a skills migra migration policy is actually a policy that unfairly and, and arbitrarily says that the movement of people who do middle class jobs is fine, even desirable, and the movement of people who do working class jobs isn't. From my perspective, it's a tragedy that the government seems determined uh, to ditch uh, freedom of movement. Freedom of movement for EU citizens which of course means the loss of freedom of movement also uh, for uh, British citizens. Because the huge uh, success of free movement in the EU, the freedom to move uh, for any reason you want, simply to experience a different country, to work elsewhere, to retire, to be with the person you love, uh, is being stripped away. Uh, and it is a huge counterpoint to those who warn uh, that free movement somehow um, uh, is a threat to everything uh, that we believe in. The fact is, is that whether we're in or out of the EU, there is nothing to stop the British government uh, from being uh, much more open, or indeed fully open, uh, to those people who want to come here to start a new life, to contribute to our society, uh, and uh, to make this place a, a richer and more uh, prosperous and exciting place to live. Thank you. And let's have uh, Manira, please. Um, during the campaign um, on the EU uh, in 2016, I uh, campaigned to vote, um, I campaigned for leave. And um, I made the argument that uh, my position on immigration is that I'm uh, a liberal on immigration. I believe that immigration is a good thing. It's a positive benefit to the UK, historically has been. Um, but I recognize that there are um, challenges with immigration as well, and I believe there should be immigration controls. Uh, that means that I want uh, freedom of movement to end um, uh, under the EU, but I also want to welcome immigrants from EU member states. And I don't see that that has to be a contradiction. Uh, it's possible to be positive about immigration and yet at the same time still want immigration controls. And that seemed to me quite a simple statement that lots of people could not get their head around. And um, particularly in the sector that I work in, in the arts, uh, there is a huge hostility to any idea of immigration controls and borders for many of the reasons that um, Philippe has um, set out. Because borders are seen as xenophobic, um, a way of keeping people apart, stopping people who love each other from coming together and so on. And those are very emotionally compelling arguments. But the position that I set out is also the position that's held by the majority of people in the UK. And I think it's worth trying to understand why they feel that way rather than assuming that they are simply xenophobic and racist and they don't want to live with people who are not like them. 
because I think that that um, uh, is a very unfair way of describing their position and um, uh, how they feel about um, immigrants. I think most people in this country, and the opinion surveys um, show this, most people recognize that there are economic benefits to immigration. Um, there are huge social and cultural benefits as well. Uh, and that the number of people who are hostile to any immigration has gone down uh, markedly in the last 20 years. It's, it's now a minority of people. They're still there. There are racists in this country, and I absolutely wouldn't deny that. But most people, I would say, have a nuanced view. But they also recognize that immigration and the benefits of immigration are not always felt equally by every single group. And uh, particularly unskilled workers um, have had uh, uh, a negative, a more negative experience of immigration, although that tends to dissipate over time. And uh, even though it's hard to talk about a consensus when it comes to economic benefits of immigration, I think it's broadly recognized that there is a, a net positive effect, but it doesn't always uh, last. Uh, both the negative and the, the, the positive don't always last over time. Societies adjust. But people do recognize that the scale and the speed of immigration is a challenge, and it has an impact particularly on things like population growth and the ability of a society to be able to accommodate people, both in terms of public services and the provision of services, planning for school places and hospitals and so on, housing, uh, but also cultural integration. When large numbers of people come into a society, that has to be managed to some extent. And a lot of people would argue that, yes, we want immigrants, but we have to have a way of being able to um, accept and integrate them, and there needs to be some expectations uh, on either side. I think that there is also a really interesting argument that immigration has become a way of avoiding some difficult questions in British society about our economic model of growth and whether the reliance on immigration, and particularly on population growth in cities like London, is necessarily uh, the most um, effective and healthy way to grow an economy by increasing the number of people, increasing demand, um, whether that's sustainable in the long term, and that essentially that has been a way of um, uh, trying to uh, maintain a certain level of uh, quality of um, living, certain standards. Um, and that there has to be a bigger question about how our economy works, about productivity, and so on. Uh, by the way, also, I would argue that immigration is not uh, uh, the solution to problems in the, the developing world either. The idea that the only way in which you can help people in the developing world is through allowing them to come uh, into richer countries. That has uh, lots of problems too. It's not necessarily in the interests of Romania that 30% of their doctors are coming uh, into uh, richer European countries that has implications for those countries as well. So I think the moral case for immigration and essentially for ending immigration control is much more complicated than many people uh, um, uh, would argue. If you accept, therefore, that there is uh, a nuanced position on immigration and that you think that there should be immigration controls, the logical consequence of that, then, is that you have to accept that there are borders and that those borders have to be policed and enforced in some way. And this, I think, is very interesting and difficult for the British public to uh, have a strong and strident position on, because it's clear that there is a contradiction there. We need immigration controls to be enforced, but we don't like the execution of it. In general, we are not comfortable with deporting people, particularly people who have lived here for some time. Uh, but there are large numbers of people who are here illegally, uh, the estimates are uh, between 500,000 and 700,000. It's very obviously very difficult to measure. And a new, uh, every year, um, new illegal immigrants come into this country, possibly around 50,000 to 70,000. So those are significant numbers. And the British public wants to control those numbers. It wants to reduce the number of people who come, but is deeply ambivalent about ways in which we do that. And the question then becomes, how do you enforce a border? Do you do it at the ports? Do you stop people from coming in? Do you end what has essentially been a very fluid uh, kind of migration system? We do allow people to come in on temporary visas. We allow students to come in. We essentially are not closing uh, the island off. But then you have to have a border somewhere else. And is it at the level of public services? Is it the hostile environment? And I think that that is something that the British public is very uncomfortable with enforcing. I would like to see someone like Philippe argue 
uh, what the alternative is. What is the alternative? Actually, his position is to have no immigration controls, which I think actually is a very logical and coherent position. It's not one I happen to share. But it's much more honest and open uh, than many people would admit, certainly many politicians. Remember, the hostile environment was started under the Labour government. So it's a cross-political uh, uh, consensus that there have to be some immigration controls. Um, so I think that it's um, important that politicians don't lie uh, on the other side as well, that they can pretend that they can uh, have a, a softer position on immigration uh, whilst at the same time satisfying the public's demand that it should be um, kept under control. I'll make one final point, which is about citizenship. Um, there are some people who would argue um, that citizenship is irrelevant in this day and age, that we should live in a world where people move flu um, in a fluid way between countries. It doesn't matter where you're born, it's where you want to get to. But national citizenship is also our vehicle to democracy and, and de democratic accountability. And people do feel that they should have the right to make decisions over the country, and it shouldn't be outsourced um, uh, uh, to technocratic experts. They feel that being a citizen has meaning. And that, I think, is something that, that does need to be defended in the immigration debate, that people feel that they should have control over who comes in and what, what rights they have uh, and whether that undermines um, their ability to control uh, decisions that are made in, in the country as well. So I think citizenship itself is, um, has become kind of um, uh, uh, seen as a negative. Actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's held very much by people as a positive as well. Thank you, Manira. Right, absolutely loads to chew on there. Um, I want to come straight out to the audience. Manira is spot on about, the, about this issue uh, in, in, in terms of the current system that we have had under the EU in, in, in terms of migration as opposed to immigration. I think we need to be nuanced. And I think what, when many, the sort of, sometimes the sort of mixed messages, you know, what does the public want? And I think if, if one makes that distinction between immigration, which is wonderful, the idea of newcomers becoming citizens, that's entirely different from the model that Europe has been pursuing, which is one of turning citizens across Europe into migrants. It's a sort of vampire-like sucking up of those people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And I say vampire-like, obviously that's uh, reference to uh, uh, Marxist capital. And after all, most of those countries were socialist and they weren't very well aware of, of those um, uh, uh, analogies. It's a model of liquid capitalism. And whereas the past pro-immigration policies were ones of solidarity, the current pro-migration policies are deeply pernicious to um, democratic societies, both for the newcomers and those already there. It's, it, it's a model that essentially rep, uh, uh, replicates what we see in the Gulf states of privileged expats, a minority, and then a vast majority of exploited um, uh, 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 migrants. It's absolutely pernicious for democratic policies. And when we look at the, what's happening in Southern and Eastern Europe around this model, it's absolutely appalling. What you've got, the cost of that, it's the number one issue in, in Southern Europe, their depopulation. It's an enormous cost. The cost you've now got, for example, in, in um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll finish here, you've now got a major crisis of care for the elderly because all the people of working age are being sucked into the northern capitals of Europe to work in exploited uh, 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 conditions. And, and as workers, uh, a friend said that in the mid-1990s, the going informal build, uh, rate for, for in, in the building trade, informal work, was £50 a day. It's the same today in the informal sector, and that's the reality for many, many migrants. Who do you think is responsible for integration? So after immigrants come to the country, do you think the government should be responsible for integrating them, or the people of that country, or the immigrants, migrants, refugees themselves? And then also, how do you think 
they can best integrate? Like ideas, there's no right answer for this one, um, but I'm curious about your thoughts on integration into the culture here after the get-go. Hi, yeah, I'm interested in how much notice we should take of public feeling. It's uh, Immigration is one of these topics that I think um, falls very quickly on emotive response. And so you get, as Sabina said, this kind of seesawing of, of reaction according to the things that are happening in daily lives. So I'm wondering, is that a threat on democracy if you sort of ignore this, this public feeling that, that is hard to pinpoint? Or should we constantly be listening to this, this up and down of public sentiment and what, what the kind of people in power need to do about that? Uh, the historian Vico believed that history moves in cycles. And I wondered whether the panel believed that attitudes towards immigration similarly move in cycles or is there a continuous progression in the thoughts and attitude of the public towards immigration? Uh, sorry, just You're a very, very quick story. In the rundown northern town that I live in, uh, in the Asian area uh, right next to where I live, it was, it was a very strong leave vote. And what's happening in that area is that lo so the uh, Polish guys are coming over and working and they're, they're, trans uh, they're, they're changing the houses with, through multiple occupancy. So what, what was a very settled family area that's paved, lots of kids running around, is now has become basically a young lad's playground uh, of guys who are feeding the local packing plants. And that's what really drove the leave vote in the Asian area in Wakefield. But I've got a, um, so just a little anecdote there, but I, the question I have is what do we, what, what should make a citizen? So how do you become British? So at the moment, a lot of the argument is around economics. So are they economically useful to us? or sorry, useful to the factory owners and the you know, office cleaning companies and all the rest of it. Um, but, but surely it should be something much more than that. And so how do we, you know, artists or, or, or people have an affinity to, to uh, you know, British culture, whatever you define that as. So it, I think it's a question for everybody is, is, is what should, um, you know, on what basis should people become British citizens? Great question. Um, let's go back to the panel. Let's start with the issue um about the whole stuff around the EU um, and about the whole, uh, obviously, it's all linked to Brexit and working out the right deal. I've, it's interesting. I've been on quite a few panels with um, the organisation, uh, the Three Million, about making, you know, very similar. Well, there's a lot of similarities in terms of the Windrush and the EU stuff, but there's a big fundamental difference. Um, the difference is that actually, I think the EU citizens will probably get a better deal than the Windrush generation, to be quite honest despite the fact that there's a long history and connection, if you go back to slavery and enslavement. Um, secondly, um, if you go to the Caribbean or to Africa, you still need to have a visa to come into Britain, despite the fact that these were former colonies of a part of the British Empire. And then when Britain joined the, EU, um, joined the Economic un Union uh, in the 70s, it turned its back on the Commonwealth. It literally turned its back on the whole of the Commonwealth and that's led to the whole development of immigration acts, which have worked against people of color. And the, and the immigration system is deeply flawed and deeply racist, and it works against people of color. And, and, that has, and that, in many ways, that's why a lot of people from BME backgrounds actually voted leave. They felt that, hold on, European people are getting a better deal than us. We've, we've, we've given blood, said, and you know, we've fought in two world wars. We've taken the economic wealth of the countries over 100 years, and yet we're treated quite poorly. So, um, so when it came to that EU summit, they came to the uh, Commonwealth Summit in London, when a number of Caribbean countries were thinking about the idea of walking out, which would have been quite embarrassing for the Queen being the head of the Commonwealth. So Theresa May had to apologize again, in that, and, then that, and that probably led to that final straw of Amber Rudd losing her job. Uh, and now, the, now, now Britain wants to engage with the Commonwealth. It's got a lot of work to do to convince the Commonwealth, I mean, in London, we had the Commonwealth Institute. That was a place of bringing the Commonwealth together around integration, identity, etc. So more work needs to be done on that. And that leads to the next question around um, whose responsibility. Governments have failed um, from the Second World War, or even before the Second World War, to tell the public that we are inviting, these people are British, they're going to come and work along with you side by side. They're going to buy properties. They're going to rent properties. They're going to work. They're going to go socialise in pubs. They're going to go to your churches and accept them. The government has never done any public information programmes 
compared to the money spent on people going to Australia or New Zealand, where a lot of money has been spent on preparing people that or to settle into Kenya or a or, or, or place like that. So the government has not, historically, has never had a program to develop the whole stuff around integration, recognizing difference, recognizing diversity. It's actually been down to us, people of color, and people from uh, mainly from the uh, mainly from the left in many ways who've worked toward the issue about anti-racism and discrimination to say to, to everyone's the same, everyone should be treated equally, you know. And and if you for those of people, I mean, for those if you if for those um, that were in Britain at the time after the Second World War, Britain was a boring, drab place. We had one radio station, one TV station, fish and chips. What we have now, we have colour, we have diversity. If all migrants stopped working in London for one day, this whole city will come to a complete halt. And yet people will say, you need to leave. And so there's still, we still have to do this ongoing education. And that's why I launched the campaign um, for Windrush Day. Because in Britain, we do not celebrate by migration. Other parts of the world celebrate migration, have Labor Days, memorials. We have nothing at all. Um, DCMS, the government department, um, did an opinion poll some years ago to find out the most important parts of uh, aspects of post-war Britain and people uh, and this was like a public opinion poll and people voted for the letterbox and the, and the mini uh, as symbolism of post-war Britain and people also voted for the bow of the of the Im image of the Windrush ship uh, and that is the only thing that we have in Britain which talks about post-war migration and 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 so I'll, I've been working with a number of years with faith leaders community activists NGOs politicians, celebrities, to celebrate migration. Not, similarly, not necessarily everyone being on the Windrush ship from the Caribbean, even though, ironically, we're Polish people, and people from Malta uh, on the Windrush ship, but the whole idea of having a wider conversation of promoting the positive aspects of migration as well. And then my final point on, I'll, I'll just finish on about Britishness. I mean, the Windrush scandal is not about immigration policy. I don't see it as immigration policy, even though the whole arguments and technicality has been about immigration policy. It's about has, it's been about citizenship, because there were British citizens, and the question is, we have different demarcations. What is British? So if you are from a, a very privileged background, you're auto, or if even uh, you're seen as automatically British. If you're from a working class background, you're seen as British. But when you start to graze outside um, particular accepted norms, you're not seen as British basically. So this is a big issue around the whole stuff around, around Britishness, which I know Gordon Brown tried to have a debate about some years ago, um, didn't quite work out. But this, the heart of Windrush is about Britishness. What is British? And you know, is it a cross between East Enders and Brideshead Revisited? Is that Britishness? <laughs> or is it about Britishness about the, the how we are, how we identify ourselves? And what's quite clear, if you got to know I got to know quite a few of the victims of the scandal. They saw themselves, yeah, they have, we have a Caribbean heritage, but we are, seen, we are British because we've been here, we've, we've contributed. You know, my family, if I look at my family, my family contribute, we're involved in the First World War, involved in the Second World War. You know, we've got a long history. And the question, and the, and the whole stuff around um, Britishness, particularly from my perspective, is that we are told all the time we're not British because of racist immigration law, stop and search. Just the, the disparity around the, the, the lived experience that we have. So we need to have a big debate around that. Vina? Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you've just said because, by the way, the last time Angela Merkel had any kind of um, a dynamism to her name was when she did open the borders. And since then, it's gone downhill with her. Just wanted to mention that. But I think the um, question on integration is very interesting. Who is responsible? I don't think the state um, can be responsible, uh, you know, for, for integration, because that would, um, you know, because integration is obviously something very human and, and, and is to do with the uh, connectivity of people living in a society. Um, but there is an, you know, there is a debate going on as to who should do the work of integration and whether it should be the country taking in immigrants or whether it should be the immigrants themselves. And I think a lot of, you know, nonsense, a lot of confusion ha has been around that very issue. So, for example, I came across an article which was written a year before um, Merkel opened the border 
um, in 2014, it was uh, by the DPA, the German Press Association, so quite high, you know, high-ranking institution, and they were reporting on a, uh, a, a, a study which some kind of Quango, uh, some uh, university institution had done, and the title of the study was Germans Overestimate Their Own um, Tolerance. So they had asked Germans what they thought of immigration, and the Germans, most Germans had said, I think over 80% said that they were in favor of immigration, that they supported a full participation of immigrants to social life. So that was the Germans' view. But the institution thought they were quite intolerant because the second view was that they thought that immigrants should integrate and that immigrants should make a step towards German society rather than German society making a step towards them. Now I think, you know, that that you know that shows some of the problems. That you know the idea that people who live in a country and who take on immigrants or Im immigrants come and who are open um, should then adapt to the people who come. You know, I do think is a little bit, you know, is 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 a bit, you know, strange. And I don't think there's anything wrong with Germans saying, well, we do expect a certain amount of integration. We would like people to learn the language. We would like people to look for jobs. We would like people to, you know, just just respect the way um, uh, life has been organized uh, here. And I, you know, and I think it's gotten a lot of people quite angry unnecessarily um, by by making them look as if they were racist or intolerant if they had that what I think is quite a reasonable expectation. So uh, integration, I think, yes, has to be of course a two-sided thing. And I'm not talking about people needing to give up their the culture, but I think there should be certain demands. And I think um, multiculturalism, um, the ideology of multiculturalism has done quite a lot of harm in that, in that sense. Um, how much notice should we take of public feelings? I think we need to take a great deal uh, of notice, and I think it's not going to work in any other way. I, I, you know, I mean, if the whole you know, thing about you know, the 2015 opening of the border worked, and I think all in all it, it did actually work quite well, it's because, because of people's openness. It's not because of the government. Um, it's because people were you know, generally willing to, to accept this and to go along. Um, and I, and I, I think that you know, the, the people's feelings are actually quite astute often. So when I, mentioned, when I said people wanted more control over immigration, there are some pretty good examples why control might be quite, quite necessary and quite good. So one thing people have noticed is we've said we want to help people, we want to take on immigrants, uh, refugees. I'm talking about refugees now. And yet people did notice that the great number of people who came were young, single young men, which did cause certain problems within German society. And you know, the question is, is it really true that only single young men need help? You know, I can't believe that we don't have women who suffer from the war in, in Syria. I don't believe that there aren't any families. So what's the problem? The reason is that the way our immigration system is and our, even our refugee um, aid system works is by sort of supporting those who, who make it, you know, the, the kind of strongest, the, you know, those who, who have the, the, the muscle power or the, you know, the, 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 uh, you know the, the, the chance. Is that really fair? Is that the kind of immigration policy we want? So people's feeling on that point, I think, is, is, is quite right. Then there have been other examples uh, of things which had, which had gone completely and totally wrong. So we do have, unfortunately, not a big cap on crime, but a little uh, peak on crime um, because as a result of immigration. So we've had rapes, we've had some very unfortunate murders. And some of the people who've then been um, accused of these crimes suddenly um, who'd been taken in as asylum seekers suddenly managed to leave the country and go back to where they came, which was Iraq, um, although they'd been registered as asylum seekers. So people were then saying, well, how can this be? So I think people's feelings can often be much more in touch with, you know, with real problems uh, or, or, you know, that people are, ha do have points to make. And I think we have to take them very, very seriously. Thank you, Serena. Um, Philippe. The single most important determinant of people's life chances is where they happen to have been born. It's not how hard they work, it's not how talented they are, it's not the content of their character, it's where they happen to have been born. So you can be a lovely, hardworking, dynamic uh, woman born in an African village, and you're likely to lead uh, a worse life in every respect uh, than a nasty, lazy, dimwit born in America. And migration 
can change that. Or to put it a different way, we live in a society where we think it is unacceptable to discriminate on the basis of characteristics that we don't control, whether it is uh, gender, race, sexuality, disability. And yet, public policy is based on the, on the idea that it's perfectly legitimate to discriminate on the basis of where someone happens to have been born. Now, that is the answer to the first lady who's, who cares so much about the people in Eastern Europe that she wants to deny them uh, the opportunity uh, to move here. We've had lots of nasty language from, from the anti-immigration people about you know, swamping and all sorts of stuff. Now we have a new one, which is vampire-like um, sucking up. And the notion that somehow uh, the system that exists in this country replicates the Gulf states shows the woeful ignorance uh, of uh, that questioner. The reality is, in the Gulf states, people who work there have no labor rights. They have no potential to become citizens. They can be thrown out of the country at will. And yes, of course, in Britain, there is uh, exploitation, not just of foreign workers, but also uh, of local workers. But there are enforceable labor rights. There is access to the courts. Uh, you get the right to vote in European elections immediately. Uh, you have a, a pathway to citizenship and the right to vote in British election. It is nothing at all uh, like uh, the system uh, in uh, the Gulf states. And nor is it true, as study after study has shown, uh, that migration uh, depresses wages. Uh, any, any effects that are found are rounding differences of the order of 1p uh, an hour. So, if we allow uh, people into this country, who is responsible for integration? Uh, the second question. I think the starting point is what do you mean by integration? Integration to some people means cultural uh, assimilation, uh, to which uh, the obvious answer is, well, we live in a diverse society, and to whom, I suppose, to whom am I supposed to assimilate? Am I supposed to you know, be like Jeremy Corbyn or like Boris Johnson? Am I supposed to emulate uh, Diane Abbott uh, or Theresa May? Merely to pose the question in that way shows that it's nonsense to suggest there's some way that you can assimilate uh, into a British society. I think a much more helpful and constructive way is that integration means uh, full participation in society, not the Gulf states model. The opportunity to participate as fully in society as someone who was born uh, in um, uh, this country. And that is the responsibility, of course, uh, of um, uh, yourself, partly about seizing the opportunities that exist, and also of all uh, the agencies, whether civil society or government, uh, that help people, whether it is uh, with training, whether it is uh, with welfare, whether it is uh, with housing, whether it is um, uh, with education. From a cultural perspective, it's about encouraging people to mix. And I don't think that you impose specific requirements on migrants. I mean, I, when people go on about, isn't it terrible, these migrants stuck together, you know, living together, they don't mix. And you go, well, what about rich white people in Notting Hill? So I'm all for encouraging people to mix, but this is, applies just as much wherever you were born, whatever your background is. Yes, it is a, a healthy society is one where different people mix, and it's also a prosperous society because many of the economic benefits of diversity come from people from different backgrounds and different perspectives sparking off each other. And for that to happen, um, uh, they need um, uh, uh, to mix. Which leads to the third question, which is how do you become a British citizen? And I think there's no, there's no right answer to that. It's pretty clear that the way now in which we measure aptitude for British citizenship is quite absurd. You know, the life in the UK test, which tests, you know, to the nearest decibel point, you know, what the pop, pop percentage of Welsh speakers in Wales is, is frankly not a good basis on deciding whether you, are, whether you should become a member of the British, um, uh, uh, the British uh, political community. Um, at the same time, some requirement of time uh, some um, uh, commitment uh, to uh, the political institutions and the laws of this country, uh, and uh, some willingness um, uh, to participate in that society, for example, for, through learning English, you know, which, all of which you know, most migrants uh, want to do. Indeed, the whole world is trying to learn English. Um, I think are, are reasonable things um, uh, to expect. And I would say, actually, it would be helpful if there were citizenship ceremonies and not just for people who want to become British, but also for people who are born in this country, um, that actually we should make this not something which is about people who merely want to become British, but also people who've been born into British society, and you know, a, a ceremony perhaps when you're 18, which makes you 
um, A, aware of the huge benefits of, of living in society, and B, makes you feel part of it um, uh, in uh, a non-restrictive way, i.e. where you say uh, you can be different uh, and still um, uh, belong. And that finally, on the last question, yes, I do think attitudes to uh, immigrants move in cycles. Manira? Uh, I think Philippe's um, first point about, uh, in response to the questioner about um, concerns about people uh, being treated increasingly as migrants rather than citizens, was quite an interesting um, example of the way in which this debate has become very moralized. And there's a degree of, um, if he doesn't take this too personally, but it is personal, um, uh, of a, a moral superiority that anybody who dares to question the rights of people to move and their freedom to move, who wants to shut them out, must be uh, inherently immoral, uh, wants to deny these people any possibility of success, doesn't care about them, others them, dehumanizes them, uh, which is a very clever way of deflecting from the debate and the intellectual challenge. In fact, the questioner is not ignorant. She's extremely um, senior academic, very knowledgeable about Europe and European politics. Um, and it, but it, it's a very uh, convenient way of uh, dismissing an argument. Actually, there is another moral position on this, which is that it is not reasonable or fair to expect people to move in order to be successful. There was a strong left-wing tradition of wanting to raise living standards in the developing world and that there should be economic growth in those countries and that the idea that people should be turned from being citizens to migrants uh, as a way of bettering their lives um, is, uh, is also fraught with challenges. But the idea of, uh, of faith, the idea of development uh, and faith and progress in those countries has fallen away, actually, to a large extent. I think people assume that those countries are always going to be um, depressed and uh, in, in economic trouble, and therefore the only way out is for them to move to richer countries. And I think that shows a lack of um, both historical imagination and just faith in politics. But it's very, um, it's interesting how emotional that, response was and how people respond to it, because nobody wants to be against immigrants. Nobody wants to hate immigrants. And people who are concerned about immigration don't hate immigrants, which is, the, you know, I think one of the, um, the kind of the complete distortions of the debate, the idea that you can be concerned about immigration. Well, you must be xenophobic. You must not care about these people. You know, you can be concerned. You can have a view of uh, society which is broader than just yourself. Uh, and, and that's, I think, um, uh, what, what Philippe has um, sort of epitomized in his response. Somebody asked the question about integration, who is responsible for it? Um, by and large, in this country, immigration has been a massive success and people have integrated. And it hasn't been led top down by the state. Most people in Britain have been fairly welcoming. I think it's a complete uh, uh, misreading of the situation to say that xenophobia has been on the rise. And it's actually um, a slur on people who voted leave to, to describe them as racist um, uh, in general. Uh, in, uh, xenophobia hasn't increased. Um, I would question a lot of the statistics around this uh, uh, that came after the Brexit vote. Um, so I don't think that um, it's the responsibility of the state as such. But I have changed my position on this in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, I was very sniffy about things like citizenship ceremonies. And I thought that they weren't particularly British, and I thought they were a bit naff. And then I went to one. Um, a friend of mine got her citizenship. She's um, Greek national. And um, she wasn't taking it particularly seri seriously herself. But I went along and you know, felt that somebody should be there with her. And I was quite moved by the whole experience because it, it brought home to me how important citizenship really is to immigrants. It means something to them to be part of this country, to get certain rights and privileges. And they have a feeling about it. And I thought one thing that we should actually do is we should allow other people to attend citizenship ceremonies and to watch them gaining their citizenship. We should allow you know, members of the British public to go and welcome them, because actually it should be a two-way thing. It's not just about those individual citizens. We are welcoming them. I believe that integration is entirely possible with large numbers of immigrants, but it does have to be managed in a particular way. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's the, the unfortunate dichotomy of our debate that um, anybody who talks about integration, again, is immediately uh, castigated as being racist and, and being um, bigoted, wanting people uh, uh, to, to fall into some rigid uh, cultural, uh, uh, kind of cultural identity. Uh, and I think actually most people are, are far more nuanced than that, uh, including ethnic minority voters, a large number of whom voted 
um, uh, to leave the EU, not because they hate immigrants, but because they also have concerns. Uh, and, and you know, those, that, that to me is one of the um, clearest illustrations that this debate has become too caricatured uh, about how, how people feel um, about the issue of immigration. Uh, Flick, really quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's rather odd to be accused of dismissing an argument from the basis of moral superiority when I actually contradicted the facts of the argument, which is A, our economic model is nothing like uh, the Gulf states, and B, it's not true uh, that migrants drive down wages. Those were factual arguments. Second of all, I never said uh, that migration was the only uh, source of development, uh, but it's A, historical, and indeed just completely misleading to believe um, that that development only takes place uh, in places. Uh, and it also involves people moving. What was the story of the Industrial Revolution? Yes, it was the development of uh, Manchester and Liverpool. It was also the flocking of millions of people from around the country to work in Manchester and Liverpool. Uh, and the two uh, go um, uh, together. And thirdly, I haven't been slurring anyone who voted leave. I haven't been characterizing people who voted leave as bigots. So again, this is all about deflection and changing the argument and using the argument, using the word nuanced a lot uh, to actually uh, you know, hide the paucity of your own arguments. Okay, um, before I go out, um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things. I mean, there, there has been a few different ways in which immigration or the discussion about immigration is actually being used to do something else. So um, Manira earlier suggested that the debate on immigration was being used as a, dis as a distraction for... Uh, the economic model we have. A lot of what Patrick has been saying is that the debate on immigration is actually used to um, control or coerce people who actually already live here, who aren't who aren't immigrants. If I'm understanding that, and and then we have this idea that perhaps the immigration debate is um, you know wielded as a tool of moral superiority or anything like that. So I'm quite I'm quite interested in those aspects. What is, what is immigration? What is the debate itself being used to do? A few a few different things, but starting with the good slash bad immigrant trope, I don't know if you've heard of this, which is where if someone does something good, the media would be like, oh, Anthony Joshua, British, won the boxing, da da da. If they do something bad, then oh, Anthony Joshua of Nigerian descent, da 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 da. And, you know, and the pressure that puts on immigrants. So I, I, I'm an immigrant, I've, been, I've lived in the UK for most of my life, and there's a lot of anxiety um, that comes with that when you feel like you always have to overachieve, overperform to justify the fact that you're in the UK. And I think using language like, oh, um, what can they offer us? What can they do for us? Can be dehumanizing as it phrases it as them versus us and what are they bringing to the table? And just as someone who hears that language all the time, um, I just want to ask what you think of that trope and also, um, I'm really glad that you brought up the fact that the immigration system in the UK does affect us differently depending, depending on how we move to the UK. So I, um, I was, when you're, um, I'm from Nigeria, da da da, I'm black, um, and I found out when I was 18 that I couldn't go to university because of my status because I couldn't access student finance. And that literally capped my potential. Um, we, I joined a campaign group and we had the campaign like after three years, the law didn't, we got the law to change. But um, and I just want to talk about how um, how the current immigration system functions, um, the hostile environment and things like that. It is capping our potential, especially when we want to come here, we want to live here, and we want to benefit the society. But the law isn't is stopping us from doing that. And that can be with education or with the Windrush scandal. So um, I think we can say that the system isn't working, but we can, and we can admit that, and we can say we don't have a better idea or a solution, but I think there's nothing wrong with admitting that how it is right now isn't working, and we need to come together to look for solutions. We don't have to keep doing it as it is just because we don't have any other alternative. Um, so um, I am an EU immigrant. I've been here for six years now, and um, it's kind of funny. I, I just like to reflect on this idea of, like, when, ironically, my, from my thing, I would like to reflect on what it means to be British, because when I go back home in Spain, Actually, my parents say to me, oh, now you've become very British, and a lot of the things that the way you act and the things you do actually just don't, don't seem like from Spain anymore. Um, but uh, it, by looking at history and a lot of the symbols that Great Britain holds close to their hearts, like I think about uh, South Kensington, you know, it's called, called Arbertopolis, which is 
held in, in great uh, admiration, you know, which was made by a German prince, you know, which, which was the, the, uh, the, the husband of the queen. Uh, then I look at Shakespeare, for example, and I, lo I love the Shakespeare, this sort of symbol of Britishness, you know. Um, a lot of the uh, research is coming out now saying that Shakespeare lived in a multicultural society like London, and it's actually very possible that Shakespeare collaborated with all these immigrants, you know, and, and in fact, there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that he collaborated with, with uh, immigrants across Europe. So um, I, I, I just like to, I, I think maybe it is time to maybe realize that actually, you know, British, Britishness is about this multicultural society that we live in, and maybe that's part of what defines what it means to be British. Yeah, I just, I just want to clarify this issue. I was very careful to say immigration as a concept is wonderful. It is about turning newcomers into citizens. What I'm arguing against is the ca character of, of migration politics is different. It's about citizens having a migratory existence in which we see statements in, in um, uh, uh, studies coming out in The Independent, etc., which talks about what wonderful contribution ex-migrant makes because they come here fully educated and they leave when they don't have pensions. And, you know, I quote from here, uh, what's more this positive contribution, blah, 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 while the average UK citizen's net lifetime contribution is zero. It's very pernicious. The old pro-immigration solidarity is wonderful. I'm really concerned that, we, that the arguments around migration are pernicious to citizens whether they have been born in this country or they are new immigrants. That's what I'm talking about. It's a very different argument going on. And we need to nuance immigration from migration and its migratory existence. I, I want to come back to um, the question of what, what does it take to be a citizen, which I think is, is actually really quite difficult and, and awkward because it seems to me that if you, I mean, there's a, the guy here who talked about uh, the Albert Hall and uh, Patrick talked about, you know, does it mean a commitment to EastEnders? And clearly it wasn't meaning it seriously. And so the banality of what does it mean to be British is a really difficult part of the discussion because you've got to step past it. And if you're stepping past it, you then have to step to something. Now, I know Maria yesterday was talking uh, about um, uh, a pre political or a pre-rational commitment to, and then that question becomes, to what exactly? So I think it, it's something that we need to get a, a, a grip on, but I'm not saying there's an easy answer, because one, one of the issues is, if you say, well, our commitment is to a universal value like democracy or tolerance, there has to be something a bit more concrete about what, in today's circumstances, that means. Um, and at the very same time, uh, most of the the most positive aspects of being in the UK, such as the state is relatively benign by comparison with uh, somewhere, I don't know, I'd say Russia, uh, where the state is most definitely not benign. Um, the, the society is backing away from the best aspects of what makes Britain relatively benign. So it's, a, it's quite difficult to see how you go to uh, something beyond the banal. Uh, hi, I'm worried that... Um uh, what immigration is doing is actually importing a servant class and creating uh, disparities between making some people much poorer. I don't agree uh, with the statement made uh, by Philippe that um, immigration doesn't reduce wages. I have two short anecdotes. Uh, one, my father employed a local gardener for many years at about £10 an hour. Eventually he gave up because he couldn't compete against the incomers who were working at minimum wage. Similarly, in my mother's care home, there are some really wonderful ladies from Eastern Europe who look after very, very well, but they are paid minimum wage and uh, they're squeezing out. Um, we no longer have British uh, people becoming here as, as a consequence. As a, in essentially, British people are no longer wiping their own bums, uh, to put it frankly. This isn't a, a good way for society to proceed. Hi. Um, so I'm also an immigrant myself, and actually last week had to um, 
get my indefinite leave to remain. And it was quite hurtful, um, Manira, when you were saying that um, you know people should stay in their own countries and let's help them develop their countries because it's not going to take one person's lifetime. Um, it's actually a very hard job to be able to become a British citizen. I've been trying to do that for eight years now. Um, and becoming a citizen isn't about a test or about a ceremony. It's a lifelong commitment, I would say. And a lot of the British people, I guess, in this room or whatever, um, wouldn't be considered British if they were to try and do the test or, or go through all of the you know, hardships that um, a person like me from Armenia has to go through to become a British citizen. So I think the swiping generalizations with a word nuanced are not justifying um, the argument that you're making. Um, and I'm also assuming that you're also probably um, from a family of immigrants, just judging from your name. So it's quite an interesting thing to say, you know, an immigrant comes and then shuts the doors behind the other immigrants behind them. So just a comment, not a question, but thank you. I, I find it's, it's odd kind of uh, listening because uh, you would imagine that um, uh, uh, people in Britain did no work uh, <laughs> to make uh, citizenship. It's, uh, in fact, been a work of uh, 200 years and more. Uh, uh, to create the institutions and the uh, uh, democratic uh, 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 life of Britain. Uh, and all of us have been working at that. You know, it's always a struggle. You know, people are surprised that there's a, a struggle to create uh, a better society. Did you think it would come for nothing? I mean, wh where would, it, would God deliver it on high from, to us? Uh, I would have said that um, all of our, our policies and the, the uh, uh, positive uh, gains in, in society, the work of, uh, of all people, of Britons, of migrants that have come to make the country, uh, uh, all of those are, uh, have created that democratic culture, which is tenuous and is by no means perfect, um, uh, and we, we have to keep, keep building the thing. But um, I think it's, it's completely eccentric to imagine that um, uh, immigrants uh, work to be uh, British, but British people don't. I'd just like to actually um, defend assimilation a little bit because I don't think I, I agree 100% with Philippe on that point. I'm also very much in favor of freedom of movement. I think it is a, a basic um, you know, a question of, of, of rights, and I, I do also think that immigration is a positive thing. Um, but I, you know, I mean, there's nothing, you know, the, the point, the danger we have is that we look at immigration as creating diversity and diversity as the aim in itself, which I don't think should be our aim. So, and it's got nothing to do with freedom of movement for that matter. Um, there are certain policy issues behind immigration. So I don't you know, disagree with the point which was made down here. That I think that you know, we do have this, um, you know, there are economic so, uh, um, interests behind it. Germany very much sort of reflects that and, you know, ha it could be more open to immigration than perhaps Poland. But there is also, you know, the, the idea of shaping society. So we've had a bit of a scandal with a social commentator, uh, uh, um, sociologist recently, Yasha Munk, saying, you know, that immigration was a fantastic, massive project because it was creating more diversity and changing our societies. And then people were saying, particularly from Eastern Germany, saying, well, we, you know, we don't particularly like to be the project, the, the products of, of a, of a um, you know, of a, of a project. You know, we've had that before in Eastern Germany. That's not what we want. That's not what we don't want our government to look at us as guinea pigs in that way. Um, and I think the whole problem with assimilation in the past was more that people were actually not allowed to assimilate. It wasn't that people didn't who came to a country didn't want to assimilate. It was more that. They were, you know, they were, they were, they were told they were, you know, they, they were constantly told that they were not citizens, not part of this um, society. Particularly, Germany has a very, very bad record on that, with with its Turkish immigrants making it almost impossible for Turks to become citizens, um, and thereby creating that terrible, terrible status of second. Uh, generation immigrant and third generation immigrant and even fourth generation immigrant, something which shouldn't really exist at all, making the Turkish community dangerously um, da dangerously isolated and creating a lot of the problems we see now. And that's why I also disagree with the idea of parallel communities being a positive thing. I've heard that very often, and I think it's become a bit of an excuse, an excuse for not being able to, to really you know, to not know what it means to be a German citizen uh, and not be able to really uh, create a, a homogeneous society in, in, a, in a positive way, a society which can agree on values 
and on common interests. And, and I think there's something very, very positive about people sticking together and saying, you know, this is our country and this is what we want and this is what, you know, this is what we, you know, what, what, we, what we'd like to be. Thanks. Uh, Philippe. Um, well, I'm glad you asked the first question about the good, bad immigrant, immigrant trope. I think it's, you know, it's absolutely right in that characterization. Um, I think fundamentally, at least for me, the argument about migration um, uh, is, uh, is about freedom and, and equality. Uh, it also uh, happens to bring economic benefits. When you're arguing, though, against the likes of you know, Migration Watch or, um, uh, or indeed large parts of the Conservative Party, who characterize it as what, does, what are the net benefits of, uh, of uh, immigration to the existing population, either you have to get into that battle or you have to concede it. And I think you have to get into that battle too. Um, uh, and I think um, that's, just, that, that's just the reality of politics. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, you're right that it, it undervalues um, uh, the, the, the broader story. And I'm glad you were able to change the law and able to, to go to university, because it would have been a tragedy uh, for your potential to be capped in the way um, uh, that you said. Um, I think the second, second gentleman is also right to say that you know, British culture is, um, over, over time, what seems incredibly British, actually very often you, you find out comes from uh, elsewhere, whether, as was mentioned before, um, uh, fish and chips or curry, uh, or indeed our language, or indeed successive waves of migration, um, whether as invaders uh, or as uh, migrants, uh, which have completely changed the composition uh, of this um, uh, country. Um, in terms of what does it take to become a citizen, I think the point that you made about the banality of Britishness actually is a is the sort of flip side of the fact that we have a relatively happy uh, recent history, and therefore we don't define have to define ourselves um, uh, as the people who are uh, you know uh, similar but of a different religion to the people next door, uh, or are, we are not the people who were oppressed and invaded by that big country next to, next to us. Uh, and therefore, we don't have resort um, to that way in which national groups often uh, define themselves. Um, and I would say, though, and as been mentioned by another speaker, our, our political institutions clearly aren't perfect. Our lack of a constitution is a, is a sore um, that we're, we're, we're realizing even more what a weakness it is. At the same time, uh, I think there are strengths about um, Britain, whether it is the banality that you might call it of the NHS or indeed uh, our political institutions or indeed um, uh, English language uh, or indeed um, our common culture and those things are things that we can celebrate together without um, uh, uh, not welcoming people from outside or indeed not without um, uh, uh, looking down uh, on others. I disagree with the person who said that we're importing a servant, servant class. As always, you use the power of anecdotes against the overwhelming wealth, wealth of studies by people pro and against migration, none of whom find um, the same uh, findings um, uh, that you do. Uh, and I empathize with uh, the lady who, and her struggles uh, with indefinite leave to remain. Anyone who has had to deal with the UK's immigration system in a, any way, shape, or form will tell you uh, what an awful dehumanizing um, uh, in, endeavor it is, how you're treated like shit, um, how very often your documents are lost, um, uh, how your life is put on hold, uh, and uh, it really is nasty and improper um, of a government department uh, in advanced democracy to be uh, behaving um, uh, in that way. And I agree also with the gentleman who said that obviously British political culture was created um, uh, by uh, previous, primarily by previous generations of Britons, in each, in each generation only by a small minority generally of those who are pushing for change. Um, the reality though is that most people who are born in Britain today uh, you know, didn't create that culture. They're, they're living on the, the shoulders of giants. And we, while we make, we make small advances with each, um, uh, with each generation, whether it is pushing against racism or um, um, uh, gay rights or trans rights and so on, um, uh, that for the most part, um, we're simply lucky to have been born here uh, rather than having created the conditions in which we live. Patrick? Sure. So um, some years ago, I did a campaign uh, called 100 Great Black Britons because... Um, to challenge the counter narrative. The BBC did a campaign called 100 Great Britons, where the public voted for um, Winston Churchill as the greatest Britain of all time. When the BBC launched this, um, they didn't have one person of colour on, on the official BBC list, apart from Freddie Mercury, who was born in Zanzibar, 
of Persian parents. So at the time, this is about going back about 12, 13 years ago, everyone complained about, and this led to the whole debate around Britishness. A lot of women complained, there weren't enough women on the list. A lot of Irish people complained, there weren't enough Irish people on the list. Scottish people complained, there weren't enough Scottish people on the list. And people, um, black and Asian people complained because we weren't on the list. So I did an alternative list. And if you look at the history of Britain, going back a thousand years, there has always been a presence of the black and Asian presence and other minority ethnic presence from time and moral, moral. But yet we are caught up in this definition of Britishness, which is very narrow, very discreet, um, and, and, it, and people who don't fit into that category are classed as the other. And since the fall of the British Empire, this country is still stuck in this culture of amnesia of its own Britishness. And no matter how far you jump or you work to prove that you're British, it's still not good enough. And that's, I think, that's a point that, um, that was raised a while ago. And I think the Windrush stuff is quite interesting because it had a, it, one of the reasons why um, the public really got behind this and really got the government to seriously think differently about how they were implementing the hostile environment, the question in the hostile environment, was the whole stuff, what is a good migrant? Or what is a good British person? So if you work hard, you pay taxes, you keep your head down, all that usual stuff, then you're all right, you're British. But all of a sudden, if you become, you know, if you get caught up in something, or you're now foreign national, and we're going to deport you, by the way. So these are kind of big issues which I think this country needs to grapple with. And I think, you know, I, I hope through this Windrush conversation, we have a proper conversation around what is Britishness, because there are lots of people born in Britain who, um, like you, what you said, that you had to, you were probably treated as a foreign student to get to, you know, because you weren't seen as British enough. And I think we need to change it. It's a fundamental change, and, you know, probably we haven't got the time for this, but I'm, I'm hoping that through the Windrush scandal, we can have a mature conversation about identity migration as well. Uh, Manira, really quickly. Um, I am from a family of immigrants, and um, I also have from um, my parents and um, elderly relatives, but also um, uh, I have newer members of my family who um, have immigrated from abroad uh, from my, um, my husband's family. So um, I'm very sympathetic. I'm very pro-immigration, as I've said. I do not want um, people to just stay in their own countries. I believe that our borders should be reasonably fluid and that we should allow people in and out. But I do believe there should be controls. Um, partly because I don't just think of myself as an immigrant. I am a citizen as well, and I have a concern for the society. So I am able to transcend the specific ethnic identity that my family have to have a concern for society, which is what I think it is to be politically engaged as a citizen. And that is an important part of citizenship. Um, I don't expect every citizen to agree with the same values. I don't think citizenship, in that sense, should be values-based. I think we should allow disagreement, have disagreement as citizens. Um, but I do think we should have a common concern for the society that we live in. Um, and, um, you know, the, the questioner asked me, does that mean that you sort of, um, you kind of, you want to shut the door behind you? And that, again, is a very kind of, um, uh, I would say it's quite a hurtful phrase, the idea that I would just kind of betray my own people. Um, but I, th I think that's a, um, uh, an unfair characterization. I just wanted to come back on something that Philippe said, uh, which is anyone who's been through the British immigration system knows how to humanize. I've been through the British immigration system. I've been applied for visas and definitely to remain. I'm a British citizen now. I don't find it dehumanizing. Uh, mistakes will always be made, but it, it's a question of comparison. Which countries in the world have a much more humane and tolerant immigration system? I think one of the problems with your position is you're you're beating up on one of the most tolerant countries in the history of humanity, which is what this country is. Uh, one of the most welcoming countries in the history of humanity. And I think we need to remember that when we have this conversation. Hi, uh, I was just wondering in this debate on immigration, where does colonization of our strongs feature? So when we Next talk- Next debate, about decolonization, right. Um, <laughs> well, okay, but I mean, specifically my question was just, when we're talking about a moral responsibility, should we also see it as a reciprocal for past wrongs. Right. So should there be like a special space for that in immigration? I suppose I have one question, and maybe it's for Philippe or others. Um, what is the limit? Uh, if 30% of people who live in sub-Saharan Africa say that they would like to move to um, richer countries in Western Europe, is there a limit on that? And I think that is an important challenge. I'm pro-immigration, but even I recognize I'm nervous about what that limit should be. And I think this com country can accommodate a large number of immigrants. I think that there is some uh, 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 
sometimes a very um, fearful um, attitude about immigration. I do think it's right that, that lots of the impacts, the negative impacts, dissipate over time and that your economy needs immigration. But I do think it's, it's important to put back the question, what is the limit? And is it an appropriate model of growth both for those countries and for this country? Uh, and I think that's the kind of debate that um, it would be interesting for the British public to have rather than this kind of, I think, very binary, um, uh, you're either for immigration or against it. Philippe? Well, I'm glad you had a good experience with Home Office bureaucracy. Um, you know, it's extremely costly. It's generally very slow. It makes terrible mistakes. Um, and it ruins people's lives. And I'm glad you had a different experience. Um, and I'm not beating up on British society per se. I get these arguments. I've had these arguments on the BBC where people say, well, you know, you've got, you've got a French name. Why do you think there's you more immigrants to Britain? And I go, actually, the arguments I'm making about uh, immigration and freedom of movement actually apply uh, broadly, universally. This is not the argument about Britain uh, in particular, and yet you're, you're forever forced back into, into, into thinking that way. Uh, you know, I, I was born in London. Uh, it's not only my hometown, it's a place that I love. I'm not particularly beating up on, on, uh, on this country. Uh, I'm arguing in favor of a better world, a better world that is possible, a better world that used to exist, a better world that exists within the EU, uh, and a better world that can exist um, uh, more broadly. And in answer to the sort of swamping fears, the reality is that most people don't want to move, and when people can move temporarily um, uh, and can move freely, uh, actually you find that um, some people come and go, but not huge, huge numbers of people don't um, move. It's precisely when you force people to make a choice, it's either you know, don't go at all or stay forever that people end up being forced to stay forever. Thank you. Sabina? Yeah, I agree that border controls are not necessarily a bad thing. I, I very much go along with what Hannah Arendt said, who has experienced the statelessness and who said that the worst thing is to not belong to any society, to not have any meaning well, any meaning well, any meaningful way of engaging in any community, to have no rights and responsibilities, because it means that you are basically up, you know, you're basically lost in this world. So I, I would very much agree with you. So, so sadly, 2018 immigration policy border controls are inherently racist. Um, the gentleman points saying that we should be grateful for Britain. Um, it's a tolerant society. Um, I do recommend you to read David, David Olusegun's book about the history of Black Britain, um, because it's only until three years ago that we as taxpayers paid last bit of money to those people who benefited from the slave trade and slavery, and yet those victims are still not being recognised. Very similar to what's happened with the Bundes today. Thank you. Can we thank our panel, please?